So when I did the first episode of this series, I had 54 subscribers. As I film this, I have 155. How did that happen? So thank you all so much. Uh, and if you're one of the newcomers, welcome. I hope you like what you see. Hello there, I'm Simon. Welcome to my channel. Today's topic is another 12 deities, which also happens to be the title of the video. So today we have another look at the ancient Greek pantheon, as I introduce to you 12 more deities that are so obscure that you've probably never heard of them. Look, Greek mythology is ridiculous, and there are so many deities that I can probably keep this going for decades if I want to. Question is, do you want to? Let me know down below. Now, let's meet those deities. Dike is the goddess of justice. She is also the second of the Horai. I've talked about her sister, Eirene, in an earlier episode, and I'll cover Eunomia in the future. Basically, the Horai were the goddesses of the seasons. On top of that, Dike was also in charge of justice and judicial rights and the likes. Because of that, she is often called Dikaiosune or Astraea as well. But those two are also goddesses in their own right, so I guess that's what happens when there are too many deities in charge of the same thing. Anyway, her parents were probably Zeus, obviously, and the titan goddess Themis. She had a daughter called Hesuchia, who grew up to be the personification of tranquility. So her job was to provide advice for Zeus, though I'm not sure how often he'd actually follow it. And also to keep an eye on the human judges, and if they violated justice, she'd go up to her dad to complain about it. But she was also said to actively punish injustice. She is often depicted with a staff, which she uses to beat up someone called Adikia, the personification of injustice. Next up, Dolos. This guy is basically Loki, except not gender fluid, as far as I can tell. Dolos is the personification of trickery and treachery. Now, it's not clear who his parents were, but he does seem to go back pretty darn far, because the suspects are either Gaia and Aether, or Erebos and Nyx. So his origins are definitely primordial. That's like the first generation of deities. Now, Dolos was also an apprentice to Prometheus. You know, the guy who stole the fire and all that. He has a complicated relationship with the gods. Anyway, Dolos was his apprentice, and one day Pro was working on a statue, which would become Aletheia, the personification of truth. But when Pro was called away for a bit, Dolos took his chance and made a copy, a forgery, which looked almost exactly like Aletheia. Except that, due to a lack of clay, she didn't have any feet. So when Pro returned, he was impressed and wanted to take all the credit. So he just baked both statues and brought both to life. And the original became Aletheia, as intended, and the copy became Pseudologos, the personification of lies. Number three is a lady called Doris. She was the daughter of Okeanos, the primordial god of the river Okeanos. Now, that river is said to be encircling the world, so I'm guessing the ancients just didn't fully understand how big it actually was, and that it wasn't really a river as much as an ocean. Doris's mother was Okeanos's wife, Thetis. Being the daughter of such an important river god, Doris herself married the god of the fish, also known as the Old Man of the Sea, Neraus. As such, she was a mother of the Nerids, or however you want to pronounce that. 
their 50 daughters who would protect sailors. One of the Nerids was actually Amphitrite, Poseidon's wife. 4. Ekegeria. Now, her name is probably derived from the words ek, which means out, and geir, which means hand. So, her name can be translated to out of the hands. What out of the hands? Weapons, mostly. Because Ekegeria is the goddess of truce. So, she personifies the ending of conflicts, if only temporary. Unfortunately, we don't actually know all that much about her. But we do know that she had a statue at Olympia, where the ancients worshipped her. Which makes sense. They had the custom to have a grease-white truce during the Olympic Games. So it was to be expected that they would worship truth personified. Number 5 is called Eleutia which is derived from the verb eleuten, which means to help. She is the goddess of childbirth, and it's basically her job to help out when people are giving birth. She was a daughter of Zeus and Hera, which means she has an awful lot of siblings, but a lot less full siblings. For all the kids Zeus had, he only had like three with Hera his wife. So Elautia is also the sister of Hebe and Ares. One story she features in is the story of the birth of Heracles. You probably know that Zeus had difficulty with being faithful to his wife and one time he got a lady called Alcmene pregnant. For some reason he decided to name the child Heracles which means glory of Hera. It's like he was trying to tease her. Like, eh, jokes on you, I got away with this. Anyway, Hera found out about this, because of course she did, and she had sent Eleithia to stop the child from being born. And that worked for a bit, until Alcmene's servant, Galinthias, spotted her and distracted her for a moment, so Herc was born. And she was so angry about that trick that she turned Galinthias into a polecat. <laughs> Up next is someone called Eleos. She is a personification of mercy and compassion. She was one of the daughters of Nux and Erebos, so she has a lot of siblings. But she is one of the nice ones, like Philotes. Anyway, apparently she had an altar at the Athenian Agora, when a guy called Adrastos went to pray for pity, and subsequently the Athenians went with him to fight Creon, king of Thebes and pretty much the villain of Antigone. Reason being that Creon said that Adrastos' men weren't allowed to be buried. Clearly, that's Creon's favorite mistake to make. Number 7. Over halfway through. Let's talk about Elpis. If you know a little bit of Greek, you probably know that Elpis means hope. So it won't surprise you at all that she is the personification of, well, hope. According to some versions of mythology, she had a daughter called Feme, who was the personification of gossip. Not sure what the connection is, but there you go. Now, you probably know the story of Pandora's box, right? The gods want to punish the humans for being humans, and so they make a lady called Pandora, and let her marry Epimetheus, Prometheus' brother. And they gave her a vase that she was not allowed to open. So, of course, she opened it, and out came all the bad things in the world. Well, apparently, they literally trapped the Daimones in that vase. Nice. And one of those Daimones was Elpis, who, upon the opening of the vase, decided to stay there to comfort humanity. Can we just talk about this for a second? Because this doesn't make as much sense as you think it does. So, the vase opens, and all the bad things get out to infect the world. 
How does staying in the vase help humanity? You're mixing metaphors. If leaving the vase means spreading around the world, staying in has to mean not spreading around, right? So logically, as the story is being told, the world is now infected with everything evil, but there is no hope because she is stuck in the vase. But then they say that she stays in the vase to give people hope. But if that's how it works, we already had hope before, except now we're also rid of all the bad things in the world. But apparently staying in the vase and leaving it do the exact same thing. Anyway. Eight, Eos. She is a Titan goddess related to Helios and Selene. You know, the deities of the sun and moon. And Eos represents like the transition between those two. She is the goddess of dawn. So every morning she would ride out ahead of Helios to drive out the dark of night. So her job was literally to go shoo shoo. She is called Rosy Fingered by Homeros amongst others because she turns the dark into pink, I guess. Now it seems that she was in some ways the female version of Zeus because she had a lot of lovers, including Orion and Phaeton. Which is kind of funny, because that's like telling Apollo and Artemis, you two take my siblings as jobs, huh? Well, now I'm making out with your ex and your son. Next up, Epione. She is married to Asclepios, god of medicine. As such, she is also in charge of something medical. I guess they want to keep it in the family. So, Epione is the goddess of the soothing of pain, which is pretty essential in medical care. Unfortunately, we don't have a clue who her parents are, and any myths that feature her seem to have been lost to time. But we do know her kids, because those are quite famous. So, she had five daughters, who are collectively known as the Asclepiades. There's Yasso, goddess of cures, Aigle, goddess of radiant good health, whatever that means. Hugeia, goddess of good health. Akeso, goddess of curing. And Panakeia, goddess of all cures. Not sure what the difference is with Yasso, so I might get back to that in the next episode. Number 10 is a goddess called Herse. Unfortunately, there's not a lot to say about her. Her parents are Zeus and Selene, so it makes sense that she is the goddess of you. I mean, someone needs to put all those drops in place, right? Legend has it that she later went on to run a chocolate making company, but this has not yet been confirmed. The penultimate deity of this episode is actually a trio of goddesses called the Charites. You may think I'm cheating by counting them as one, but let's be honest, this is my channel. I can do what I want. So these three are the goddesses of beauty and grace. They are actually the servants of Aphrodite and Hera. According to the Theogony, they are the daughters of Zeus, of course, and Eurynome, a sister of Doris. So who exactly are the Charites? Like, what are their names? Well, that's kind of the problem. There are supposed to be three Charites, but throughout Greek mythology, there are like 17 named, if not more. One called Aglaia was said to be the wife of Hephaestus, apparently after he divorced Aphrodite. Another one called Pasitea was married to Hypnos. It turns out that the Spartans and the Athenians both only had two Charites, called Cleta and Phaina for the Spartans, and Auxo and Hegemone for the Athenians. But I guess all I can really say about the Charites is that they exist. 
but what their names are, what their jobs are, and even how many there are, depends on who you ask. So I suppose there's no way to get it wrong. <laughs> and finally, number 12. Gelos is the god of laughter, and he is part of the following of Dionysus. Nobody knows who his parents are. I guess they can never really get a straight answer out of him. He always gives a joke answer. Apuleius, author of the book The Golden Ass, which is a real book, described a festival for this god, but he might have just made it all up on the spot. I'm just going to assume it was a real thing though. We should bring that back. But that's all for today's show peeps. It is time for the YouTube thing. You know the drill. Everything is in the end screen. If you don't know what to comment, let me know who your favorite out of all of these is. I think mine is probably Ikegeria. Also, if you know of any extra bits of information you can share about any of these, feel free to leave them down below. And who else can I talk about in this series? Because there's gonna be more of this, trust me. But not today. Thanks for watching.